the Bible says to us, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Your word have I stored in my soul that I may not sin against you. Sanctify them with your word, for your word is the truth. Grass withers, flower fades, but the word of God will abide forever. By your hands with me, as we ask God to sanctify our hearts and tame our ears to give us attentive minds that we would be able to dissect and digest the truth that he has for us. Father God, how grateful we are for this time, how grateful we are that we are part of the people we have left behind, realizing that a good number of people who were supposed to be here today or who thought they would be here today are not here with us. They have been called home into eternity. But for us, you have seen fit to allow us to remain. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit, who authored the scripture, will open our own mind to it, and that you will use the message this, this hour, this evening, as a source of blessing and challenge to us all. And this is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. I actually thought that uh, that we fin that uh, we finished the book of Hebrew, you know, chapter four last last week, but we didn't. So we're coming back to it. Our the person who controls our go to meeting or, or forgot to hit the record button last week. And so we weren't able to record the message of last Wednesday. There are a lot of people who are waiting overseas for this message. And they, they receive the message and they share to their friends. And in fact, they called me and said, what about Wednesday? I said, no, unfortunately, we didn't have it. But also for our own archive, we don't have to have lesson two and then lesson three is not there. So we will reteach last lesson, but as always, there's just no way it's going to be the same thing that I said last week. Because I, if you ask me, I, don't, I may have even forgotten most of the things I said. Owing to the Holy Spirit, I'm sure he, he will come in another way to make the truth new to you, fresh to you, and at the same, at the same time, make it even more concrete. The Word and our great high priest, that is the topic covering verses 12 through 16 of Hebrews chapter 4. The word and our great high priest. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4, verses Verses 12 through 16. As we look to see what the, uh, the author of Hebrews, the church, the recipients of this powerful book, we see the author keeps hammering the importance of sticking, 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 staying, the staying power being able to stay with the word. So he begins, in, in fact, uh, 
it is warning. He wants us, first of all, as he begins this chapter, chapter four, therefore let us fear, lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. It's, it's a warning, therefore, therefore let us fear. The, the author includes himself in this, uh, fear uh, corner or fear syndrome or fear whatever you want to call it let us be out uh, be beware it's not just fear that you are so frightened that you're so afraid you know let us be weird let's be weird lest while a promise remains of entering his rest any one of you any one of you any one of us should seem to have come short of it that is to say it is possible that you we will come this far in our spiritual walk and fail to enter and come short of entering into god's rest moment by moment to rest that has been made available to us in verse 2 for indeed we have had good news preached to us and this good news is doer the good news of the gospel of our lord jesus christ which brought us into his kingdom by faith alone and then the good news of his biblical teaching which is taught which is preached to us every day you know, or every time we have class uh, on sunday or on wednesday with, with uh, our group so he says you have it but the word they heard did not profit them it's not just a matter of hearing, hearing, hearing. There are people who are so busy hearing, hearing, and they hear, it enters this from this ear and it flies out of that ear. And by the time you finish telling them, you ask them an hour later, I'm not talking about one week later, an hour later, what did you hear? They say, hmm, I don't know what you're talking about. And that's, I don't know, how what you hear not even processed that means it doesn't mean anything to you it's inconsequential and so the author says what they heard by the most powerful preacher that I ever lived in the time of the jews moses himself with a powerful voice moses didn't need megaphone he didn't use any last speaker the two over two three four million heard his voice with no last speaker god gave me a voice and caused his voice to transmit his message to his people and nobody ever complained that moses we didn't hear what he said last night all heard the message but the author said it didn't benefit them it did not profit them and then in verse 11 skipping to uh, in verse 2 again it tells us why why did they fail because it was it the word they heard was not united by faith in those who heard the just shall live by faith the just shall live by faith uh, they did not unite the word that they heard, they didn't unite this word by faith. As a result, it did not benefit them. It did not benefit them. We must learn to live by faith. And again, I have said it, every time God does whatever it is in your life. Remember, I'm talking about the same God of the year of yesterday. Is the same God of today. Every time he does anything in your life, the reason why he does this is to give you a frame of reference, to magnify his power, his awesome power. El Shaddai, the Almighty. When he does something very incredible, he does so to create a frame of reference. So don't discard anything that the Lord does for you because he's coming back to require what he did in the past. So 
sit down if you have been just forgetting and don't do it anymore from this day on begin to check in your life count your blessings name them one by one whenever god does anything in your life don't forget it because he's going to use it to hold you accountable when you are face to face with a problem in other words don't you ever forget what he did for you in the past or how he rescued you in the past use that if you can lean on to that it will help you to rest at ease it will help you to rest comfortably it will help you as a believer in the lord jesus christ to stand firm it will help you why so simple because you'll be able to look back and say if god has done this if god has done this for me he can also do this he can also do that that's what god that's what pleases god the just shall live by faith we walk by faith not by sight you don't if you keep your eyes on your circumstances if you keep your eyes on your circumstances you will never trust god that's what the we got, we got the perfect example with peter peter saw the lord walking and he said lord if you are truly the lord let me walk like you the lord said get off the boat come along and he did for a little while his eyes were on the lord and he was walking with no problem until he saw a storm coming his way the moment he took his eyes off the lord and looked on the storm the storm was magnified all he thought was drowning and down he goes until he looked back to the lord and said save me and he did off your eyes on your problems and fix them on the lord think of the things he has done in the past for the same who did the past actions or past things in your life is the same who is still on his throne to do it again and so in verse 11 let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience we have heard these warnings if we continue to fall short we can only blame ourselves and not the lord we can only blame ourselves how do we get there how do we accomplish all these things the author insights in verse 12 the word the word he praises the word if you would verse 12 for the word of god is living and active and sharper than any two a sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart speaks of the word as something that is so powerful shepherd and any two edged sword the author no doubt was thinking about the sword that the romans used that gave them victory upon victory special sword very short sharp shepherd and razor itself it cuts through just very close to the enemy the enemy is the enemy is finished it is is shaping on both uh, both edges so that when it comes through just one straight cut it cuts both front and back it destroys the intestines or it destroys whatever the contact the the knife or the sword makes and so the author looks at that knife or that sword and looks at the word of god and says the word itself is sharper than any sword you have ever seen it's more powerful than anything that you as a believer in the lord jesus christ it, it, it divides you see the word when it's, it's, it's when it enters into you it does the word it, it does the work of diagnosis it, it enters into you and diagnoses you lays you bare and be able to pinpoint where you have failed there's no way i can get into you i don't know what you're thinking i don't know who you are. i don't know 
I know who you are as a person. That's all. But the inside of you, only the world can penetrate where no man can penetrate. Only the world can arrest you. Only the world can convince you. Only the world can change you inside out. No man can do that. That's how powerful the world is. The world can bring a prideful individual and turn that individual upside down. The world can change you, can change your life, can flip you upside down. Only the world. That's how powerful it penetrates, it divides the soul, the, the soul, the spirit, and the uh, and the body. So Paul, uh, I keep going to Paul, even though people say that he wrote it, which I don't, I don't believe he did. I've, also, I've already shown us in the beginning why this cannot be credited to Paul. Whoever wrote it was not an apostle. That's, that's for sure. And so here in verse 12, it says that the word of God is living. It's not just living, it's not stagnant, it's active, which means it produces result. It's active. very active and sharper than any two-edged sword and it pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit and, bo and body um, which which the spirit and the soul are not the same with the spirit we are able to communicate to god or god communicates to us as we are, as we read in romans 8:16 that the spirit himself communicates to our spirit. The confirmation we have today, I'm sure you have the same confirmation as I do, that I am a child of God. How do I know? Somehow, I don't know how, not verbally, the Holy Spirit assures my spirit that my name has been recorded in the book of life for all eternity. That conviction, is what keeps me going. That what that what gives me hope. And so there's a division between these two. Our soul is internal. Our souls are internal. Uh, being internal, we will always have our souls. When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost that contact with God by means of their spirit. That's why you said they died spiritually. God told them, you don't eat of this fruit. The day you eat the fruit, you will die. You will certainly die. No question about it. But he did, they ate and they lived for hundred more, hundreds of years more. They didn't die immediately. But they died spiritually, instantly, separated from God. And that's the death that God was referring to them dying suddenly you will die and the holy spirit restores that spirit that's what you call regeneration in theology regeneration it means whereby the holy spirit restores that spirit that was lost in the garden you call it the rebirth in john chapter 3 verse 5 jesus said that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Two, mention, two, two mentions of spirit there, that which is born of spirit. The, the first spirit is Holy Spirit. The second spirit is human spirit. That which is born of Holy Spirit is human spirit. So human, Holy Spirit is that is one who gives birth to human spirit. That's what you call being born again. Unless you are born again, unless your human spirit is restored by the Holy Spirit, you cannot enter into God's kingdom. So this world can penetrate the small thin division between the spirit and the soul. And it's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Only the word of God can do that, can judge. I don't know what your intentions are. But often our intentions are so rotten. Our thoughts are so horrible. 
Jeremiah said it so well in Jeremiah 17. He said, the heart of man is so deceitful. Who can tell it? Who? The answer is obvious, nobody. A person can approach you looking so innocent, looking so well. Even a person can even bring something to you or gift or do, but the individual, what he's thinking is so corrupt. How do you know? The person may even laugh, give you the, 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 the smallest, give you the laugh you have never seen in your life. But inside, the intentions are not good. We've seen it. We have been, we have become victims of people like that. And so only the word of God can go inside and be able to unveil, uncover the intentions of man. Nobody else can except the word. And so it's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The intentions of the heart. Uh, sometimes uh, how we approach things, uh, our we can say one thing but in our heart, we are having other things in mind. Only the word can convince us. Now, so quickly, yeah, if you have written this down last week, you can just look, make sure you got get all this, get your note that you have all those words written accordingly. I have 10 benefits of the word. There are a lot more, but I just put 10 benefits of the word. Remember, Jesus said, the word that I have spoken to you, they are both life. The word that I have spoken to you gives you life. It is life itself. Peter said, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? You have the word of life. This word is life in itself. <laughs> let me, let me, I don't know, you know, you know, before I give you that 10 points, I, I told you that for sure the Holy Spirit is going to come in a different way to give you this message. Even though I, even though I said it's a repeat, it's not actually a repeat. See, the, this life is not, there's no duplicate to this life. You, you agree? Our life has no duplicate. But it, I am so confused. I mean, I, I am stricken to heart. Why should anyone be playing with something that has no du duplicate? Why should you be playing with your life? Tell me. Give me one reason. If, if you, if whatever you have, you, you, something you can buy from the mall or you buy from the store. If it breaks, you go get another one. Yeah. But you get the original copy, you make copies and keep the original away. And you can keep making torn, making, making copies from the original forever. There's something you cannot make copy. Why in the world would you play with it? Give me that, answer that question tonight. Why should you play? Well, that's what you do when you don't give the word of God the attention it deserves. You play with your life when you play with the word of God. Turn to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, Moses calls the word of God your life. Not just that it is life, he says it is your life. In other words, your life is attached to the word of God. Deuteronomy 30, 30. That is true. Verse 46 and 47. The, the first part of 47. He said to them, take to your heart all the words which, with which I am warning you today, which you shall command your sons to observe carefully, even all the words of the, this law, 
Look at verse 47. For it is not an idle word for you. In other words, it's not a careless word. If it is not, he says, indeed, it is your life. You can cycle that. It is your life. If you are a person that likes to cycle their Bible, it is your life. The word of God is your life. To play with the word of God is to play with your life. And God said in, in Proverbs 8, if you do, you can lose it. You can lose your life just because you have no respect, no regard for the word of God. I have 10. So let's go quickly through these 10 benefits. One, it is a source of spiritual capacity for Christian living. It is a source of spiritual capacity for Christian living. Acts 20, verse 32. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Two, it brings health, fulfillment, and success to what we do. The, the word of God is the channel that brings health, fulfillment, and success to whatever you lay your hand, in, hand on. Psalm 1, 1 verse 3. David said, how blessed you are. Those who walk or those who make this word of God their number one priority in life. David said that whatever you do, God blesses it. James 1.25 said the same thing, that if the word of God is your number one, that God will bless whatever you do. Joshua 1.8, God himself, not, 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 not David, not James, but this time God himself spoke in James Joshua 1.8. This book of the Lord shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night so that you'll be able to do all that is written in it. Only then will you have prosperity. Only then will you have success. This is God speaking. Now tell me, how can you have true success without it? You may say, well, I have success, but I don't have the word. I don't, I don't do in the word. Your success is just a pseudo success. It doesn't last. It doesn't last. If it doesn't come from God, it does not last. It doesn't give you happiness. It doesn't give you joy. Very soon you find out that it doesn't last. But if it comes from God, how blessed are you? Number three, it has healing power. The word has healing power. Psalm 107, verse 20. He sent his word and heals them. Number four, it brings peace. Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace had those who love your word. Great peace had those who love you are well. In other words, when the word of God becomes something you have delight for, it brings peace to your soul. Number five, when hidden in the soul, it keeps the believer from sin. When hidden in the soul, it keeps the believer from sin. Psalm 119, verse 11, your word have I stored in my soul, that I may not sin against you. Number six, it counsels and guides us in life. It counsels and guides us in life. Are you looking for a counselor? The word of God will do that for you. The word of God will do that for you. Psalm 119 verse 24 says that the word of God is a counselor. personified, he acts like a person. He will counsel you. Psalm 105, and Psalm 119, verse 105, 
your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Your word, it guides you in darkness. If you find yourself in a dark room without the word, you're going to hit your foot on stones of bad decisions. One, de one bad decision after another. For you do not have light to guide your path, to help you in your decision making. Uh, many of us make bad decisions because we do not, we don't have the word of God guiding us, directing our thoughts, helping us. And so we find ourselves in darkness. S seven. It is a source of strength. It is a source of strength. Psalm 119, verse 28. The word of God is a source of strength. Psalm 119, 28. We all need strength. Every one of us, we need strength, don't you? But the word of God brings that strength. Eight. It sustains and comforts in affliction. It sustains and comforts in affliction. Sam, let's turn to this one. I like this one. I, I, all of them, I love them all. Psalm 119, verse 92. Turn with me to Psalm 119 to 92. The psalmist records, if thy law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. My friend, my brother, my sister, do you want to be crushed when affliction hits? Do you want to be crushed in affliction? The author says here, if your word had not been my delight, if your word had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. The word of God is what we, what we need so that when affliction comes, it will sustain us. But if we don't have the word of God and affliction comes, you will be thrown off God. You will lose your position. You will lose your momentum. You will lose you are standing, and the devil will knock you out of your command post. You see, Job was sustained, Job, throughout all the ordeal that he faced. What sustained him was the word of God. Inside of his soul, the more, the, the more pressure, the more he, he was squeezed like a sponge, divine viewpoint was dripping out of his soul. He can say it back and forth as he reflect on the word of God in his soul. Uh, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Only the word of God was able to convince him that all he possessed, all he had, all came from God. Only the word of God was able to assure him that what God has given, he's able to take away. Through the knowledge of the word of God, he could tell people, I mean, imagine Job inside an oven, burning. You see, it's one thing to give testimony after everything, after you have failed and you have back and forth, and then you struggled when everything was gone, phew, then you come to church to give testimony. Say, last year it was horrible for me. I was sick and I was that. The Lord, to give testimony after everything is gone based on another thing or another thing altogether to give testimony while you are still in the midst of the catastrophe imagine job job was still inside the oven burning oozing bleeding he was still inside the oven he just stick his neck and looked at his three friends and he told them God knows the way that I take. When he has tested me inside this oven, I will come out of this oven like a gold. That's wonderful. That's amazing. That's what I call testimony. That comes from the word of God in his soul. He knows 
And he can say, I know my Redeemer. I know my Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. And he, he tells them, even you look at my flesh, you can't even recognize that I have I had flesh. See, look, this, look at this flesh. Job was using was using something like a, a scraper, removing the skin, removing very dead skin. He looked at his skin and he told them, You see this skin? If this skin is destroyed, this this my face, not somebody else's face, my face shall see God. What a man, what a confidence, what a hope. It comes from the word of God in his soul. Again, verse number eight, it sustains and comforts in affliction. Number nine, it is a source of great joy, Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Jeremiah 15, 16. Finally, number 10, it is the source of spiritual growth. It is a source of spiritual growth. You cannot go spiritually apart from the word. And that brings us to verse 13, Hebrews 4, 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Interestingly, uh, often we think that uh, we can do things, we can hide, we can do things that uh, nobody sees, nobody knows. We do, uh, Jesus said that those who do evil things, they like dark places. They don't want to be in the light because they don't want to be exposed. There was a story told us about a, a young boy, a, a young boy, perhaps when uh, a, a, a young boy in the house and another man was coming to the house when the husband was not at home. This man, every time he, he will come, he will know that the husband is not home, he will sneak in to be with the married woman. And this child, perhaps when he was one year old, the man would say, well, what does the child know? Of course, he doesn't know anything. But as the child grows, when he was like about two years old, this man, the, the husband was not at home. This man again sneaked in. And suddenly, the, the man came home. And this, this man quickly went under the bed. And the husband came into the room. And uh, I said, this young boy at this time, he was about two years old or so. And the husband was talking to the wife. But the man has already hidden himself under the bed. So this young boy suddenly said, pointing to the bed, he said, Mama will sleep here. He was pointing to the corner that the mother sleeps on the bed. And daddy will sleep here, was pointing to the other side of the bed. And then he pointed to the middle. He said, we sleep here. He sleeps in the middle with the parents. And then he looked under the bed and said, where will you sleep? There you go. Where will you sleep? You, you get up and tell us where you sleep. And I know where we sleep here. Only one bed. And that begins the trouble. You can hide, but you cannot hide from God. Everything is so clear. Everything is laid bare before him. David knew this because when David committed adultery and murder, he thought that he was home run. Nobody could see me. Nobody saw what I did. Not so fast with God. Later on, he knew, he found this to be true. In Psalm 119, verse 12, David says something very striking. Psalm 119, 
I'm sorry, 139 verse 12. Psalm 139 verse 12. See what David said? Even the darkness is not dark to thee, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to thee. In other words, anything that is done in darkness, you don't think that God doesn't see it. Because darkness doesn't mean darkness to God. Darkness is as light as it, anything can be before God. Everything lays bare. That's what the author is saying here in Hebrews 4.10. There is nothing, there is nowhere you can hide from the piercing arrow of the word of God. There's no place you can hide from God himself. Everything lays bare before him. And so as you look at this uh, uh, in, in terms of as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are called to shine as light. We are called to shine as light. As we shine our life must also shine. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your life so shine that those in darkness may see and glorify your father. Is your life shining? That's a question. I'm asking myself the same question. Moses, is your life shining? I can only answer that question because it's a matter between me and the Lord. And so will you? We can only answer to one person. Don't, don't answer me. Who am I? I'm not a fruit inspector. I'm not going around inspecting your life. I'm going to call you on the phone and say, what are you doing tonight? Where are you tonight? Where did you go? No, that's not, 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 none of my business. By the way, if I ever called you and say, where did you go? Feel free to tell me Moses is none of your business. <laughs> I will not be upset because it's none of my business. Where you go, what you do, is a matter between you and the Lord. Because he is the one who called you and has called you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And so what you do in that can be exposed when God so chooses to expose our work. Look at what Job said. Look at the book of Job 34.22. Job 34.22. As we are rushing to wind down our lesson this evening, Job 34 32. I'm sorry, 34 22. There is no darkness or deep shadow where the wonders of iniquity may hide themselves. There is no darkness or deep shadow where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Daniel says similar thing. Daniel chapter 2, I believe. We are talking about God to whom we must all give account. Verse 22, Daniel 2, 22. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness. And the light dwells with him. The light dwells within him. He knows. God knows. We can be assured of one thing that he knows. And that brings us to verse 14 and 15. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. This is a very interesting passage, two, two verses tied together here, dealing with our great high priest. our great high priest. It begins by telling us since then. Wait a minute. It's like, take a seat. 
all these struggles? Why are you abandoning your spiritual faith? Why are you abandoning your spiritual work? He said, since we have such a great high priest, no priest of the Old Testament was ever called great. Only Jesus Christ was great. He was the priest of priests. Since we have such a great high priest, you see, the dual function of the lost priesthood, there are dual functions of the lost priesthood. These two are in the nature of mediatory, mediatory and the intercessory. Mediatory, our Lord Jesus Christ is our mediator. And he's also our intercessor. He says to you, since you have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, uh, human, human priest, the priest of the Old Testament only went to the Holy of Holies. They didn't go upward, not even three feet up. They were not lifted up anyway. They only entered into the Holy of Holies. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, didn't go into the temple. He went straight to the presence of God with his own blood, as we see in our story in Hebrews. And so we have someone who is greater than the priest of the Old Testament. He's unique in that he's priest and he's also a king. No, no one ever had that position in the Old Testament, in the Jewish kingdom. No one ever retained those two offices, priest, king, only Jesus Christ. And he's telling us, let us hold fast our confession. In other words, look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. When you think of bailing out, stop and look to him. Look through his eyes. As the author tells us, the problems of this life will shrink. The, sing, the songwriter tells us, all these things will look so dim. Look to him and to him alone. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And so Jesus is our great high priest. As our great high priest, he does the work of media, mediation. He is our mediator. This Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, Jesus Christ is our mediator. 2 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Christ is constantly mediating before between you and God. You have no other person to represent you but him alone. And he's, he's doing this with compassion. He's doing this. Our Lord Jesus Christ is mediating. He's just not mediating. He's, everything he's doing, he's doing it with you on his mind, just as he had you on his mind when he was hanging on the cross. Everything he does, you always on his forefront as he thinks of you, as he helps you, as he brings you close to the throne room of the Father, as he's mediating your case, John calls him our advocate. You have an advocate in heaven, one who is representing you 24 7, one who constantly looks to you, looks after you, looks about your weaknesses, because he himself was once weak. He was, once, he was weak like no other. So he understands what it means to be weak. He was wearied. 
It was weird in his mind. He, he tasted what it means to be persecuted, to be maligned, to be judged. He understood, he knows what it means to be falsely accused. He, he himself was falsely accused from every angle. What's more, our Lord Jesus Christ also knows what it means to be abandoned. Have you been abandoned? Have people deserted you? Have they failed you? The Lord knows all this. When he was arrested, all his disciples deserted him. All his friends that he ate with deserted him. Have you? You been? I don't know. Maybe somebody has. Uh, somebody has done something to you. Betrayed you. Have you been betrayed? <laughs> we got betrayers everywhere. They smile, but inside of them, it's not so good. They can betray you, looking at looking at you, in eyeball to eyeball. Have you been betrayed? Our Lord was betrayed. I don't, don't know what Judas was thinking, but he betrayed him, gave him over to his to those who want him dead or who wanted him dead. He has tested it. And so he can stand and defend you. He can come to your, to your aid, to your rescue, when you go through all these things as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 15, it says, for there is one, uh, back again to Hebrews, I'm sorry, Hebrews 4, 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. The, the, the Greek word for sympathize here is the word sympatheo. Sympatheo means to have compassion upon anyone. Sympatheo. Sympatheo, to have compassion upon anyone. We do not have someone who does not have compassion for us. Jesus Christ is dear with broken heart, defending you, sympathizing with you. He doesn't, he doesn't just sympathize with you and say, oh, uh, carry on, move on. No, he comes to your aid. He comes to your rescue. He said, Lo, I am with you. In Matthew 28, 1920, Lo, I am with you. Not just once, to the end of time, to the end of the ages. Jesus is with us. It's with you. Uh, to be with you doesn't mean he's just following you around. The, to, I am with you is an idiom, idiomatic expression, which means when Jesus says I'm with you, it, it means he's your provider. He will provide at all times. Paul says in, in Philippians 4:19, my God, my God shall supply all your needs according to the riches of his glory which is rooted in Christ Jesus alone. He will supply. He never runs out of supply. He has unlimited supply. By the way, he didn't say, my God shall give you all you want. No, he didn't say that. You see, sometimes what you want is, what you, is not what you need. If you're hungry, you may want steak. Mm, I want to have a taste for steak. And God just gives you spaghetti. That's what he wants you to have tonight. He understands your stomach. Maybe your stomach has a little bit of a, uh, some problem that you, you haven't seen. But the steak would have caused you to have uh, stomach ache all night long. He just gives you spaghetti. He knows what you need. The bottom line is you are full. That is the bottom line. You are hungry, spaghetti fills you up. Or he may give you something else. But if come what may, he will always give you what you need. And so Paul says it so well, my God shall supply all your needs according to the riches of his grace. And so he meets to be with you also means 
he will protect you. There can never be anything that can happen to you as long as Jesus Christ is with you. He is the one, he's there to protect you from every kind of danger. He will shield you, he will shield you from danger. Why? Because he's with you. Look at Paul. Paul was in danger after danger after danger, but the Lord was with him. At one point he told in at the end of at the end of his ministry, he said, When I was in my trial, everyone deserted me except the Lord who was with me. Everybody can desert you, but the Lord cannot desert you. People fail, people can fail, circumstances can fail you, but the Lord cannot fail you. His word cannot fail you. His grace is ever ready to take care of the things that needed to be taken care of. And so my brother and my sister, the author tells us, that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who has been tempted in all things as we were yet without sin. He has gone through what we are going through so he can identify every, at every juncture with us because he himself has gone through that. I, I, I said last week, I'll say it again. A young, a young woman who is having her first childbirth. If you ask me, oh no, if you ask her, not me, I haven't given any childbirth. If you ask that young woman, who do you want to be in the labor room with you? Your dad or your mom? No second guessing. Of course, my mom. It, during the child, during the, the labor, if the mother was delaying or it's not coming, it's not coming as fast as she can, and this lady is screaming, and the father stands by and says, honey, hang on, hang on, hang on. Your mom is not here, but I'm here. The, the, the daughter will say, I don't need you, dad. I need my mom. Because she knows that the mother is the only one who understands her pain. Jesus understands your pain because he was once in that situation. He can sympathize with you because he himself has gone through that route. He has tasted every suffering that you will ever suffer. He has pioneered. So he can confidently say to you, I am with you. Don't let anybody deceive you. Don't let circumstances rob you of this tremendous, incredible, precious plan that God has set before you. Don't let anything rob you of mixing the word of God with the faith, by faith. But with that faith, you cannot, you cannot please God. And so he tells us, what do we do in, in, in terms like this? What do you do? What records do we have? It ends by telling us the records that we have in verse 16. Hebrews 4.16. It says, let us therefore draw near with confidence. Confidence, that's what you need to the throne of grace. See, that throne is not just any throne. That throne has an emblem of grace. You walk into that throne, the first, first banner you see is grace. You don't deserve it, you don't own it, you don't work for it. If you enter on the basis of your merit, the door will shut behind you. We shut in front, I mean, you can't enter, you just shut, you can enter. But if you enter into that on the merit of Jesus Christ, 
you are welcome. It is not on our merits. It must, it's, we enter not because we are good, not because we have improved ourselves, not because we have changed anything. We enter on the merit of Jesus Christ alone. The, 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 the songwriter says, nothing in my hands I bring. When you enter into God's presence, you come with nothing. You bring nothing to the table except what Jesus has brought. And so let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Why? That we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. That we may receive mercy. Mercy is withholding what you deserve. That is the meaning of mercy. What you deserve, God withholds it. What do we deserve? We deserve total annihilation. We, des we deserve to be destroyed. We deserve to be thrown into the lake of fire and be burnt for all eternity. That's what we deserve. God withholds it and gives us what we don't deserve. What, what is it that we don't deserve? Enter into his kingdom. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That is grace, unmerited favor. In the expense of the work of Jesus Christ, you have received everything God has for us. Amazing, isn't it? Incredible, isn't it? All is because of God's work. And so, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, don't throw away your confidence. No matter how difficult this this may be, no matter what we are going through in life, I don't. I know. I don't. Not for one second. I don't want to. I'm not demeaning what you are going through. You know, some of us we are going through hell. I, nobody is disputing that. But Paul, on the other hand, says, when you weigh what you are going through. It's like a light paper in comparison to the glory that will be revealed when Jesus Christ returns. What you are going through now is tiny bit in comparison to what will be revealed at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has something bigger than your problem, bigger than your situation, bigger than anything that you have ever faced or will ever face. God is not silent. Don't you ever think he is silent? Don't you ever think that he has forgotten you? That's blasphemy to think that God has forgotten you. Once you are purchased, you become his property. And your property you will be forever. His eyes are upon you. He is the apple of his eyes. Anyone who touches you, touches him. Because anyone who touches you, touches the people of his eyes. That's what the Bible says. Can't you have confidence? and not throw away, and not back out, and not walk away. You stand immovable, always abandoned in the work of the Lord, knowing that you are told in this life is not in vain. Don't let anything rob you of your blessing in time and eternity. The author says, hold your confidence. Don't back away. Hold faithful is he who has promised. He is faithful. He will always be faithful. And so I call upon two people to pray because we're going to do what he says in verse two, verse 16. Let us draw near to the throne room of his grace. So whoever is so moved, take us to the throne room of his grace. Pray as the spirit leads you. Just two people Unmute yourself and pray as we close. Holy God, we bow before you this evening. First of all, I want to thank you for your word that we have heard, which is a great source of encouragement to you, to us. We thank you because um, once again, we have uh, 
awaken our thoughts, our minds towards the importance of your word in our life. That without it, we cannot honor you. And without it, we cannot live the Christian way of life the way the Bible has marked it out for us to live. We give you thanks. We pray that uh, in line with this reward that we have received, let it be a source of challenge to us. That we will miss it with faith and live it the way you have destined for us to live it. That we, as fifth gospel, wherever we find ourselves, we will represent you through our lifestyle, through the words of our mouth. People will come to know, more especially unbelievers, will return to you and become part of your family. Precious Father, we also pray for as many that are passing through one problem or the other, on the basis of the word that we have heard this hour, that you are there with us, even in the midst of the darkest night, in respect of what it may represent in each, of, in each and every one of our life. Continue to give us this confidence to continue to draw unto you, close to you, knowing for sure that you're ever with us. Thank you. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 One more person. Are you afraid to draw to the throne room of his grace? I hope not. Our God and Heavenly Father, we are ever grateful unto you. For you have been our Father. Father, you have always fulfilled your words and your promises towards us because you never fail. You promise to be uh, the one who fights our battles. You promise us that in all things we shall be more than conquerors. That hope God is sustaining us because you have been standing by our ways. Father, this evening, I want to thank you for everything. Thank you for our individual lives, the lives of our families. We want to lift up countries, places where there are trouble, fighting, atrocities going on. I want to thank them, lift especially the, the, the country Nigeria. And I know that there are many other places where there are problems going on. For that, we, you ask us to bring, to come to a throne of grace with prayer and bring our petitions unto you. I want to ask, ask you to I want to ask you, Father, to intervene and bring your peace because we are the prince of peace. Peace. You say that you will fight our battles. These ones, we don't know how to fight them. Even in Israel now, there's trouble, um, war going on between their people and the, the neighbors. Father, you have been winning, you have been giving them victory because nobody can fight and have success when you are with them. Say, so well, if God is with you, who can be against you? So that we are, the hope we have is that we won't allow the, the people of Israel to be put in shame. They will always come out victorious, as always. We want to thank you, Father, because we know that your victory is ours, because you is the more omnipotent. You are many putting God. That's not. Um, that's nothing you cannot do. But I want to thank you this evening because we know that individually we know where this where it's pinching. You know the problems the world is going through. I want to ask that you be with your people, give us hope, give us victory, give us peace, and give us testimony that people will hear, and then want to come and test and 
because they say, come and test and know that you, the Lord is good. Thank you, Father, for you have always been with us and we continue to be with us. As we dismiss this evening, Father, we are not going out of your presence. We ask that you continue to be abide with us. Let your word that we hear always be a lamp to our, to our feet and a light to our path. Always guide us so that we will never fall apart I'm away from you, from you, from your truth. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for having heard our prayers, even beyond what you have asked for. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Holy God, now we are grateful for all that you've done. Thank you for your truth. I pray that you, this truth, we live, you cause it to live in our lives. But I pray that uh, you continue to challenge us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep our hearts burning for your kingdom. Draw us close to you. Father, we pray that you, you will cause us to live, to be a beacon of light to this world. Wherever we find ourselves, I say amen to the prayers of my brothers which they brought before you. As we all said amen to those requests. And now we pray that you continue to challenge us day by day and let us not lose hope. Cause us not to lose sight of this great work. And help us no matter what to look at unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And Father, we pray that you will strengthen our inner mind, that you will strengthen our hearts, that you will strengthen us, that you will draw us close to your heart day by day. As the days are drawing near, Paul tells us we are closer than when we first began. Keep reminding us that we are not, we are just sojourners, we are passing by. We are just passing by. This is not our home. We have not arrived yet. Keep our eyes where it belongs. Keep our eyes where it belongs in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you again for the group that tuned in. I pray that you continue to bless all of us and those who weren't able to tune in because of one thing or another. I pray that you ex the extension of your grace will also be upon them and help them to be able to go back and listen to your message, your truth. Thank you again. As we rest tonight, may your peace be ours in abundance. When we wake up, cause us to be refreshed and give us the strength to face tomorrow with great joy. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen.